It's delightful to see such a good group here for conversation series in January. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Karen Ellison. I'm the Associate Director for the Center for Biology and Society here, and I run the Life Science Ethics Program in the School of Life Sciences. Uh, we're very excited this semester to have a collaborative undertaking with the conversation series. So those of you that have been here before know the idea with this is to get a couple of faculty and one of our grad students together to talk about big issues. So this is not a classic have someone come and tell you about their research program for 40 minutes, but rather to open up with a few remarks and then engage the audience more broadly. Um, as we were looking at this year over the summer, we had several people propose um, that we have sessions around conservation. And so we drew these together for a theme for the semester. And this is our opening one where we were looking at organizing concepts for biodiversity conservation. And then as you can see, each month here we have um, follow-up sessions where we're going to talk about uh, the field of conservation and the professionals in it, uh, and then stakeholder collaborations. And then finally, we have Jonathan Losos coming from uh, Washington University in St. Louis to talk about organizations. Um, so hopefully you all can join us for several of these, and we can develop not only conversations in this hour, but also across the semester around the topic. So I'm going to try to keep introductions brief. Um, today we have three folks. We have Greg Kabenlik here from the Hastings Center. He is a research scholar there and director of their editorial department and also the editor for the Hastings Center Report. For those of you who are not bioethicists by training, the Hastings Center is a nonprofit um, independent scholarly center that's been around since 1969 and has had an important position in the foundation and continuing development of the field of bioethics. Uh, Greg's particular interests are around um, concepts of what is natural, what is human nature, and how those relate to emerging, particularly biotechnology. So he's had a series of projects around values in synthetic biology uh, and was a key player in the Gene Drives report that was done through the Academy with Jim Collins. So our second uh, panelist today is Leah Gerber. Uh, Leah is one of our faculty members here in Seoul's. Um, a marine ecologist and community ecology particularly, and the founding director for the Center for Biodiversity and Outcomes. So her work is both at the intersection of understanding marine ecology, but then also how do you take that ecological knowledge and move it into the spheres of science policy and public communication, and the center sits at that intersection as well. Um, so exciting work there. Our third panelist today is Elliot Milner. Elliot is one of our PhD students in the program for biology and society. He is also doing a simultaneous master's in American Indian studies. Uh, and he comes with a background both in conservation and history and philosophy of science. So particularly interested in questions about how do native communities and Western trained scientists collaborate and communicate around issues of conservation. And he's developing a really interesting project where he will be collaborating with the Navajo Nation Fish and Wildlife um, Department over his dissertation and both conducting conservation activities but also thinking critically about how that collaboration works. So that's our group. Our charge for today is to think about what are the concepts that underlie um, biodiversity conservation and how do we think about those. And Leah is going to start us off with a few comments about basic concepts. Thanks, Karen. So I have a couple of slides to guide us through the my initial remarks. Um, first of all, thanks so much for the invitation. And it's lovely to see such a packed room. And thanks to the center for the delicious lunch. 
Um, so as Karen said, my name is Leah Gerber. I'm a professor here in Souls, and I also direct our Center for Biodiversity Outcomes. So I was really excited by the invitation uh, to come and talk about um, organizing concepts around biodiversity. So I thought I'd, I'd share a couple um, words that um, might kick us off here. So what do we mean by organizing concepts? <clears throat> so how I think about this is, and I'm gonna actually stand up here, um, we, we have a problem. I don't, do you want me, should I sit? Or th I'm, I'm happy standing. Um, I don't wanna mess up the video though, but sorry. Um, so why do we care about organizing concepts? Well, we're experiencing unprecedented rates of bi global biodiversity loss. So that's, that's a problem. Um, and why do we care? Well, we need biodiversity to survive as a as human race. So it's it's as simple as that. Yet in the sort of quote real world of decision making and policy, we're not really accounting fully for the the value of biodiversity. And so the question to me around these organizing concepts is how do we organize concepts to bring this this sort of vague academic idea of biodiversity into global decision making and policy and sustainable development. So I thought I'd go back to an introductory lecture definition of what is biodiversity. Um, so according to the Convention of Biodiversity, uh, the biodiversity is the variability among living organisms from all sources, terrestrial, marine, aquatic, um, and it's not just the pieces of the system, but also the function of species within their ecosystem. So I think that's really important. And this includes um, the going back to an original definition. This was um, Reed Noss in 2010, um, one of the um, first textbooks in, in conservation biology. Uh, biodiversity is, you know, ranges from genetic diversity, to species diversity, to community, and ecosystem biodiversity. And I think that's really important because I think a lot of people think about biodiversity as just the list of species, not the whole complexity of the components and processes within ecosystems. So this is, um, and if you do one more, there we go. So I found this to be an interesting way of framing these hierarchical components of biodiversity that kind of cross multiple domains from structural to compositional to functional. And I, I've circled in, in red where I think most of the attention both in academic and in you know, public discourse has have focused largely on what are the species, what are the genes, but we're really not thinking about all the processes, the landscape patterns, the population structure, um, interactions between species. And so I think it's really important when we're talking about biodiversity that we're clear about which, which slice of biodiversity are we talking about or are we talking about the entire, the whole enchilada, so to speak. And then um, coming back to you know, my interest, which is organizing concepts around organizing decision-making and change in biodiversity, and you know, we have this unprecedented rate of extinction, um, just to kind of bring this to, to where we are in terms of taxonomic um, extinction risk, this, this map shows that you know, basically, it's a, a map showing the human footprint on the planet. And the, the red area are areas of high human impact. And so when we live on a planet that is pr mostly impacted by humans, um, what does it mean to protect biodiversity? Which aspects of biodiversity are most important? Um, this, this second figure here is just showing the percent of different taxonomic groups, ranging from birds to mammals to amphibians, um, just showing the percent of these taxa that are threatened. And, and the, the patterns are remarkable. I mean, 41% of amphibians are threatened, 25% of mammals, even higher percentages for plants. So if you go to the next one, actually go, just leave that. It's, yeah, 
that I'm going to just pause here for a sec. So I think one question that we often face is um, if we want to, quote, protect biodiversity, which aspects are we seeking to protect? Is it the total number of genes? Is it the number of species? Is it ecosystem processes? And then there are issues around the, the laws and legislation that are out there to protect these species. So for example, in the US, we have the Endangered Species Act, which prevents, you know, seeks to prevent extinction. But how do we do that when we live, we're living in, in the Anthropocene? How do we achieve that? Which species should we prioritize? How are we going to deal with these issues of not having even with unlimited resources the ability to save all species? So what I try to do, and one of the approaches we use in the center, is to focus on outcomes. And this is a really simple logic model where we say, what do we want to do? What do we want to achieve? Well, we want to save more species, decrease the number of species that are listed. We want to increase the consideration of biodiversity in the private sector. And we want to bring the science of biodiversity decision making. Well, how do we do that? Well, we're scientists, so we bring evidence to decisions. We form knowledge partnerships with outside organizations. And we um, use these approaches to achieve our outcomes. So my parting thought here is, and as we seek these to achieve these outcomes in biodiversity conservation by um, bringing you know, the best science to decision making, um, I think it really kind of makes us ask ourselves, you know, if we're going if we're doing all of this exciting research, um, what what is our objective? And it definitely is not my prerogative to say what our objective should be. But as a conservation scientist, it is my, my role to say, let's make our objective clear. And then we can help you facilitate a process to articulate the different alternatives to achieve that stated objective, whether it be you know, preserving the number of endemic species, or threatened species, or charismatic species. I think it's really important to be clear about the objective. Otherwise, if we don't have these unifying, unifying principles, then we're, we're failing. So those are my thoughts on at least different ways we might frame these organizing principles around biodiversity. Sorry, I stood up. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So I need, I need both mics, right? I have I don't need this one. I, technically, I'm good. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, thank you for inviting me here. This is uh, for me. This is um, uh, a little bit like uh, coming to Mecca. Uh, I, in spite of the the introduction that Karen gave me about the the stuff that I've done. Um, some NSF projects and the NEH project and the work on on the Gene Drive Committee. Uh, I feel that this is sort of the home for a lot of this real thinking. And, and I actually feel uh, slightly out of my depth. I, I have done a lot of thinking about some of the, the big concepts, but I haven't, I'm sure there's an extensive literature on uh, biodiversity that I am not deeply conversant with. So <laughs> I may say some things that will strike some people as off base, and that's just how it will be. Um, I also have a tremendous number of friends here, and it's extremely nice to have a chance to come back and hang out with uh, uh, a bunch of people who are in this room and a bunch of people who aren't, who I'll be meeting later in the afternoon. So what I thought I'd do uh, is offer a handful of disparate comments that are sort of inspired by the work on the Gene Drives Committee by some of the, the projects that I've been in. Uh, and hopefully they will, uh, I think that they will in some ways complicate uh, what you said, uh, I, I actually think that what I'm going to say, uh, the different things I'm going to say are in a little bit of tension with each other. Uh, uh, and uh, that will maybe uh, spur some interesting conversation right there. And I, I thought I was going to say, like, in about like seven to 10 minutes, something like this, three different things. A little bit about the um, 
the why question, which you handled very quickly, but I'm going to try to complicate it just a little bit. Um, uh, and maybe in a way that you won't like, but we'll see about that. And then a little bit about the uh, what it is we're trying to conserve question. And I'm going to connect that to some thoughts about the use of genetic technologies like gene drives for conservation purposes. And then I'm going to close with some thoughts about the for whom question, which I'm, uh, for whom are we doing this, which I'm going to try to uh, link to some uh, thoughts about how we would manage the conversation. And it's here that I think I'll, I'll be uh, all but undercutting myself as I go forward. So, um, so I, I, from my perspective, it, it seems that when we talk about biodiversity, we're, uh, it's a, a way, it, it's one way of getting into some more general claims about uh, nature and why we care about nature. When, when to talk about biodiversity is to, is to call attention to uh, the richness, uh, uh, the variation, uh, the, the, com the complexity, the interrelationships of the, within the natural world. Uh, and so there's a sense in which it's simultaneously to kind of zero in and to back out. And maybe what you said actually brought that out a little bit. There's a sense in which uh, we're trying to, there's a, a, a little bit of a list making kind of element to talking about biodiversity. You're, you know, you have a few hand, a handful of sort of charismatic species, but then when you begin to think about biodiversity, you're trying to list a lot of other little things that tend not to get thought about. So you're sort of zeroing in. But at the same time, you're, you're backing out and you're thinking about how all these things are related to each other uh, and, and the necessity of sort of keeping the whole system afloat. Uh, and to me, that's a very, uh, it's an interesting um, a dynamic that the concept of biodiversity uh, introduces. But it does seem to me that if we're talking about why we care about biodiversity, then we're talking ultimately about why we care about, about nature. And I think that for me, the answer is, is um, partly going to be in terms of uh, sort of ecosystem services, you know, tangible benefits. We need to care about biodiversity because we do all depend upon it. That's a, a key consideration. But uh, there's going to be, I guess I follow some of the Academy's reports in this domain, like the Gene Drives report and a new one that uh, came out last earlier this month on forest biotech. Uh, and I kind of want to throw everything in there all at once. I want to talk about the aesthetic values, um, uh, re recreation, uh, and I want to talk a, a fair amount about uh, the intrinsic value of nature. Uh, and it, it seems to me that to talk about the intrinsic value of nature is actually often to talk about what it is that really, really, really motivates us when we're thinking about biodiversity. Uh, and in some cases, it's going to be to talk about the only thing, the only reason, the really good reason that can be given to care about some of these things. If we're talking about a, a, a lot of the species um, it, it may turn, that are threatened, it may turn out to be rather difficult to give a really convincing story, I think, for why they are vital to our shared future. Uh, uh, in the Gene Drives report, there's uh, uh, something to be said, uh, uh, some sections on uh, 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 the preservation of rookeries of ocean birds. Uh, uh, some of the stuff in the de-extinction debate has, uh, is about the gastric brooding frog. It, the, and the argument that's often given is this is a key aspect of biodiversity, and we just care about it in and of itself. And I, it does seem to me that that's that's a key part of the story here. However, I hate the term intrinsic value of nature. I detest it. Uh, it, it, it seems to be very thin and technical, uh, has in, no emotional content, uh, and it points in the direction, I think, of some sort of grand philosophical account of what it is that we mean, something that will bring order and cleanliness and, and some ultimate justification to uh, our value scheme here. And I have always found those uh, attempts to provide that kind of philosophical account quite disheartening and unconvincing. Uh, and it seems to me that they do a, a disservice to public debate, uh, in part because they're, they're so arcane, uh, it's impossible really for anyone other than 
scholars quite to connect with them, and so they they kind of eviscerate themselves while they're you know, <laughs> they work it, they undermine themselves. Um, um, uh, but um, uh, I, I also think that they, uh, they, they because they're so they, they often turn out they, they turn out to work a little bit in silos. Um, the kinds of accounts that are given in bioethics are a little bit different from the kinds of accounts that are given in agricultural ethics or in environmental ethics, and there's something actually rather uh, unsatisfying about. Uh, about that. Uh, so I, I kind of back away from all that stuff, and I tend to want to take the kind of approach that I think the gene drives approach took to talking about values, which I see as a, uh, um, a relatively unphilosophical approach, a sort of sociological approach, uh, um, and to talk a little bit generally about the value that we find in the natural world, but then allow that it's going to be accepted or denied in various quarters and fleshed out in different ways by uh, different peoples, different publics who feel it or don't. Uh, so it seems to me there's it's sort, of a, uh, sort of a sociological or almost a literary approach. I find that the more convincing writing on the intrinsic value of nature uh, uh, falls outside uh, philosophy altogether with the possible exception of some of your stuff, which I think is, is quite evocative. Um, so a couple of challenges that this, this approach may raise, uh, or, or that, no, I don't know, may come to mind as I describe it here. Uh, and one is that, uh, and this was in one of your slides earlier, there's no such thing as pristine nature. So what is it, what is it you mean when you talk about valuing the natural world? They care about what? Um, it seems to me that's exactly right. Uh, about, it is equally a myth that uh, all of nature is humanized or all equally humanized. Uh, and it is indeed a kind of preservationist uh, mindset that I'm trying to lend support to, but um, it seems to me that we can still, we can still do that. There is still some uh, potential to talk about uh, a nature to preserve. Um, and another... <laughs> Another interesting thing is that this approach may, this sort of kind of sociological approach to talking about value, may run a little bit counter to what you're trying to do in a way that I don't, I don't know exactly whether I find it troubling. But if we're allowing people to fill out, publics to fill out what it is they care about, uh, then it may turn out that uh, charismatic species are the species that uh, really motivate the public. Um, and, um, and so that, uh, you know, that, can be, that can be a bit of a problem. Maybe this can be counteracted in some measure uh, by trying to bring out the, sort of the charisma of the rest of the natural world. And maybe actually that is one of the purposes one of the things that can be accomplished by talking about biodiversity, talking about the, you know, the other things uh, in the natural world. Uh, you know, the Great Hall at uh, the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, they, that's kind of one of the things I think that's, that maybe uh, uh, is achieved uh, when you go into that space, there's the great blue whale, but then there's all this other stuff, and and it's sort of it, it's quite powerful, I think, and it can get you to care about more, uh, and and then thinking about the interrelationships of, of all these things. Uh, that's a way. So maybe biodiversity. Uh, I I would worry a little bit that the concept might be offered as a kind of technical solution to some concerns about how the moral debate about nature is going, but. Uh, but maybe actually it serves a moral purpose to sort of think, encourage people to think a little bit more broadly about um, what it is they care about. If they care about blue whales, then they should be caring about these other things too. All right, so that leads into my, my second bit, random thought, um, uh, a little bit about what I want to say about what, what we should care about. Um, and all that I really want to do here is offer a caution that maybe sort of echo some of what you said, um, against thinking that this, is, that this is fundamentally a genetic story. Um, I think that one of the things that's happened in the debate about um, 
the public debate about bioethical topics and agricultural topics. And I, I mean more sort of the public realm rather than the scholarly realm here, is that uh, genes have come to be seen as being uh, morally special. They're sort of, um, they are the things that organize all of the rest of the natural world, or they are seen as kind of uh, the physical embodiment of the essences of things. And so we can tolerate a whole lot of agricultural biotechnology, but not genetic interventions into biotechnology, because there's something a little bit um, a little bit morally worse about that. And there might be a couple of reasons for that. I, you know, one is, uh, maybe I've already suggested this, it kind of fits with, with one way of trying to clean up the answer to the why question, why we care. If we can tell, a, if we can say, well, the genes are kind of the, the, the organizing principle here, uh, that gives us a, a little bit of a cleaner, simpler, a, a, a more scientific sounding answer there. Um, and another uh, reason we might be caring about the genes is the scientists have been telling us that we should. <laughs> They've been, uh, you know, the book of life metaphor that was it Francis Collins uh, trotted out with the human genome, uh, human, uh, human genome sequencing project at one point. This idea that by understanding the human genome, we are understanding ourselves at some like fundamental, uh, you know, uh, fundamental level such that to change genetic sequences would be to do some sort of like almost special metaphysical damage. Um, uh, so the scientists have been simultaneously telling us nothing to worry about here. There's nothing scary about, uh, about genetic technologies and have been telling us that this is actually, uh, you know, th these are morally special entities. Um, so, we've come to regard genes as kind of the biological encoding of things. It strikes me that this is just flat out a mistake about, about, about the world. Uh, even, I, I almost think that the, the systemic story could be complicated one level beyond, maybe, what you were suggesting. You had sort of genes, uh, what was the next species. level? Species, and then the systems within which the species, communities and ecosystems. Communities and ecosystems. But I think that even, when we look at uh, uh, individual things, uh, that uh, uh, we should be thinking a little bit more systemically than scientists, some kinds of scientists have been telling us we should. We should be thinking about uh, this, the sense in which individuals are ecosystems. Didn't you give a paper? on that at Hastings on some occasion. There is a, it is a, a reasonable, there's a reasonable case to be made that a human being is better understood as an ecosystem of organisms than as a kind of genetic code that gets played out in, in tissue. Um, so, um, so that's all to say um, that I think it, it makes more sense to, when we're thinking about what we are uh, wanting to protect in nature and what we want to do in nature to protect nature, to think a little bit bigger, to think about structures and patterns and, uh, and systems and relationships than at a kind of, uh, uh, at the, this kind of reductionistic molecular level that genetic science, science has got us doing. Now there's a, a potentially controversial implication of this line, uh, which is that things like gene drives might sometimes actually be reasonable conservation strategies, that making genetic changes to things might actually sometimes be in the service of, of conservation science. And um, for me, uh, some of the cases that I um, maybe a little bit more open to would be uh, some of the work that's been, uh, been done on the American chestnut. It's actually transgenic work and in a certain way, if you take this kind of genes as essences picture, it looks particularly troubling. But uh, it turns out you stick some uh, a wheat gene into the American chestnut and it can be made quite uh, tolerant to the blight that has rendered it functionally ex extinct in the eastern United States. Maybe some cases of gene drives to eliminate non-native rodents on ocean islands. Maybe even a few of the de-extinction uh, proposals, like the one to bring back the gastric brooding frog, uh, or uh, the bucardo. 
uh, in, uh, in Spain. Maybe those can be defended from this sort of, uh, if you're taking this sort of holistic picture. On the other hand, this kind of picture is also going to close off, tend to close off some things, like uh, if you imagine, say, the glowing plant. Do you know about the glowing plant idea? Um, that was never meant as a kind of conservation uh, endeavor, but but it raised the prospect that people might begin to stick these glowing mustard plants into the wild uh, as a way of kind of uh, sprucing things up a little bit. Why should we be stuck with Earth? We could have something a little more like Pandora from the Avatar series. Um, you want biodiversity? If it's a genetic story that you're interested in, we can generate we can generate biodiversity by means of uh, genetic technologies. But if you're thinking not just in terms of sort of genetic diversity, but in terms of some sort of syst you know, systemic uh, preservation of these existing patterns, that will tend to, um, you'll, tend to you'll, you'll tend to be very skeptical, about, uh, not just skeptical, you'll tend not to like those. Uh, the vast majority of the cases of de-extinction, bringing back the mammoth, that would only be uh, uh, a recovery of a kind of proxy of the genome of the mammoth, it probably wouldn't manage to uh, put the mammoth back within the systems that it originally inhabited, as Ben beautifully noted in uh, some pieces that he wrote on, on de-extinction. And it raises an evidentiary bar, even for the kinds of genetic technologies that I was just defending. Like, there's no point in bringing back bringing back in, in modifying the American chestnut so that it withstands chestnut blight if, in fact, it cannot uh, function within its environment in, in the way that would allow for preservation of, of, uh, of eastern ecosystem, forest ecosystems. Um, and so finally, the for whom question uh, and how to manage it. I'm, I'm just going to assume following um, um, some of the Academy's work and uh, a, a bunch of great work here at ASU, that these are questions that need to be resolved through um, public deliberative processes of some sort or another. Um, uh, so um, for me, uh, one of the questions that is really interesting is we are now just beginning uh, an NSF-funded project to explore is the question of how broad this, I, this label for whom should be. Who are the stakeholders in species uh, in the American chestnut in the east or uh, uh, systems out west or the woolly mammoth in some proposed uh, Pleistocene park in Siberia? Um, it, if you take the sort of ecosystem services approach to thinking about that why question, then you might be inclined to take a rather limited view of the stakeholders. You might be inclined to say, well, it's going to be the people at the site of release, those who have tangible social economic interests that are going to be affected by the release of this thing. But if you are thinking also about some of these more difficult questions about the intrinsic value of nature, however that gets fleshed out, um, then I think you're likelier to take a rather broad view of, uh, of who the relevant publics are, to think that it isn't just a case of uh, deliberation that, that should be done at the site of release, but regional or national or international uh, deliberation, that, that the the, sh the systems here are a kind of shared heritage. And that's kind of the idea of some of our existing um, <coughs> regulative structures, ostensibly for conservation, like the national park system. There's, I think there's supposedly some sense in which those of us who live just along the Hudson River north of New York City are stakeholders of a sort in, um, in the biodiversity found in the American West. And if you, if you accept that, then I think we, we can all be stakeholders of a sort in, in uh, whether the woolly mammoth gets brought back and the course of evolutionary history gets overturned. But I'll close here. Um, um, I think that accepting, um, accepting the need for public deliberation on some of these questions is uh, 
uh, has to be recognized as um, challenging a bunch of things that I've said. Um, uh, it could, uh, it means that the uses of genetic technologies for conservation that I was just proposing, those, those, are, those are questions that have to get opened up to some sort of uh, 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 broader conversation. The, the way in which we regard the genes, that has to get opened up to some sort of broad conservation. I think it may even turn out to be that, uh, um, that some of the relevant factual questions, not just the values questions, have have also to be exposed to a sort of public deliberative uh, process as, because the, the facts are themselves dependent in, in ways on the interests, the values that we bring. And it's going to be necessary not just to present the public with an appropriate set of facts, but to uh, uh, allow for some kind of deliberation about those. And, um, and so all this is going to be uh, uh, I said I was going to say something about how to manage the conversation, and uh, this is sort of how I think it has to be managed. And my worry is that it, this way of thinking about it will make it actually unmanageable. Uh, and uh, in order to uh, get some reassurance on that score, and I'm turning to people like Ben to help me think about uh, how the uh, his idea for a global observatory on the human gene editing project might be applicable to some of these other domains. And I should shut up at that point. Right. Well, thank you both for uh, those thoughts. Um, before we turn it over to the audience for questions, um, very interesting the way you two approach this from different angles, but it kind of converges in a very interesting way. Uh, and so one of the things I was interested in, in asking and seeing perhaps how this brings some context to the conversation is, what do we mean when we say um, organizing concepts for biodiversity conservation? Is that the actual work of organizing the concepts necessary to realize conservation outcomes? Or are there um, concepts within the, the discipline or the field of biodiversity conservation that function as organizing principles? And then secondary to that, are these things that we sort of need to cash out before we move on to um, organizing stakeholders, professionals, and institutions like the subsequent conversation series will address? I'll take a stab at that, I, um, and I'm sure we'll have different angles on the, <laughs> the question. Um, in my, my simplistic, perhaps, perspective, um, the, the answer is all of the above. Um, so I think we, you know, from my point of view in, in conservation, one of, one of the problems is that we're not very clear about which concept we're referring to. And so you talked about in the context of gene drives that we sort of get bogged down with, with genes when really we're, maybe we mean entire ecosystems and the function. And so when we're targeting, you know, gene banks, then are, is that really achieving our goal? So I think, I think I would start with, um, you know, when we talk about organizing concepts, we need to go back to the books of what are the, the definitions of biodiversity. Do we agree with them or do we want to add to them, you know, with this, this individual dimension that you talked about? And I would imagine even maybe we can go beyond ecosystems to planets um, if we really want to expand the, yeah. the idea um, in terms of planetary management, perhaps. Um, but then from that, that directly informs us about management and outcomes because if we want to make decisions about biodiversity and conservation, the first thing that we need to define is what our goal is. And so we might have very different actions and strategies depending on whether our goal is to protect species or functioning ecosystems. I think the challenge in the world of conservation practice is that it's very difficult to um, apply concepts. If, for example, it's, it's much easier to, to just log all the species and genes and say, let's maximize, you know, per, for example, a protected area that maximizes the number of species. It's much more complicated to then say your goal is a healthy ecosystem function, because what does that mean and how do we measure it? There are some metrics there, but um, I don't think the science is equivocal. And um, 
you know, in fact, I think there's an interesting dichotomy where, you know, traditional conservation biology aims to protect species. We want to minimize extinction. Whereas perhaps an ecosystem ecology perspective aims to, or I don't know if aims studies, looks at the function of ecosystems. And within that function, we expect that some species drop out, we have recolonization. We're not trying to maintain a steady state. So I think even from the, the different scales and the different definitions, we're going to have potentially conflicting approaches to conservation. So I think it's, you know, I don't have the answer. I think being transparent and clear about what our societal goals are. I thought your point was really interesting about do we really want to make this a public discussion because then, you know, we might just be pick, cherry picking the charismatic species. Um, I thought a lot about that as well. And I guess I, I, I do feel that it ultimately has to be a public discussion. Um, you know, I've circled around in discussions with, with our lab and students that, you know, it fundamentally boils down to a dialogue between the public. And, you know, maybe it's an, an education thing, not, not meaning we're going to instill our wisdom so you believe what we want you to believe, but, you know, conservation for who, I think, is, is the relevant um, a relevant question, especially when, um, you know, biodiversity in the broader spectrum of societal challenges may not be receiving the attention that perhaps it should. So. I think I, I think I can use this. So um, I was supposed to come up with, uh, uh, I was supposed to think about your question in advance, and I failed to do that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I actually, I, you, you just bailed me out. Because I, I, I think I like your answer, the, the all of the above. I take it you, you were sort of raising a question whether we can, uh, um, you, were, you were a little bit skeptical about whether or not we can wholly sort out the organizing concepts before we go forward and, and and engage the public and make engage the public in making some of these decisions in some way, um, and that strikes me as right, uh, and so it, it makes it messier. Um, it's it seems to me that there's probably still um, I kind of want a both and sort of approach here in a way. Um, um, I want there to be some sort of of I don't know some sort of special place at the at the table. For somebody with your perspective, um, to share your perspective, uh, and, and you've been very careful not to adopt a kind of uh, um, a language of, of imposing concepts on the process. But uh, here's your somebody who's done a lot of work in this domain, and here's what you have been thinking about. And it seems to me that a good a good deliberative endeavor. Um, it can't, it can't take the facts totally off the table. It can't take the organizing concepts totally off the table. It can't just start with some preordained organizing concepts. But it has to start somewhere. And it needn't be a, just a whole you know, undifferentiated soup. And so I, I, would, I don't know how this should be done at all, really. But it seems to me that there should be some way of, of um, frankly, of privileging your perspective in this, in this kind of thing. I think it's interesting how you both come together on that. I sort of see my, myself and my work as sitting somewhere between what the two of you do, and I would tend to agree with you as well. So that's interesting to see that as sort of a, a convergence point for what we mean by concepts. So um, I guess at this time we'll turn it over to the audience for questions or comments. Jane. So... Who is it who develops the organizing concepts? Is it the experts or the public or the interaction? That wasn't clear. Yeah, it isn't clear. <laughs> I can, I mean, I guess how I would respond is that it is the, the experts, it's us, and we do have textbook definitions. But I think if we're, it depends if we're organizing the concepts around the textbook definitions or around how these textbook definitions can be operationalized in achieving outcomes. And that's sort of the lens that I'm 
that I was looking at. And in that context, I think we sort of need to iterate and revisit those fundamental concepts and, and reflect back on them when we seek to apply them so that we don't get sort of pigeonholed in, in one small sphere of, of the domain of what we mean by biodiversity. Yeah. How does that answer strike you? That's, that's, I think that's roughly what I would want to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Question? So, I guess as a follow up, as someone who's also not satisfied fully with that, um, <laughs> how does then, if it's, it's expert, not textbook uh, concepts, but expert concepts, how does public deliberation not just get subsumed by expert deliberation, um, by, by framing the deliberation from the, from the get go by those concepts? What kind of imagination would you have where it doesn't just become that sort of process? <laughs> well, I, that's exactly it. That, no, I don't want to answer that question at all. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And so we gesture towards, we want public deliberation. Yeah. Like, what, why? For what reason? Like, what's, what, what's the, the aim and purpose of doing it in those kinds of ways? I, I also want there to be an answer to that question. That feels nice. But I feel like we don't ask. I mean, for me, the metaphor is a little bit that, frankly, of a, of a conversation. You have a conversation with somebody who knows something about a lot. Uh, you're uh, you're going to take that on board. Uh, and you may push back. Um, and you hope for a certain amount of reflexivity on the part of that expert. Uh, and, uh, and you go from there and do the best you can. Um, and there isn't going to be some sort of clear system or process or organizational structure that's going to assure that, uh, uh, that the experts aren't, um, aren't playing well. Um, but, uh, but it seems to me that the conversation is likely, likelier to go well if, uh, if there is that kind of input in some way at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the conversation. Uh, and that's still not a very satisfying answer, but I, I mean, I, I do think that that sort of a, some sort of conversational mode is right. What do you think? Are you? Yeah. I want to hear what you think. Um, no, I, I'm not, I won't say what I think. I'll ask a question and then point in that direction. That is, that is. So, I mean, I think it's a really interesting and important question. But one can ask the question of the of the concept from a different direction, and that is to presume that it's embedded somehow and to ask where it's embedded um, and what, you know, kind of what works, what work concepts are doing. And it seems to me another way of asking this question is somewhat differently is to point to a, a sort of an interesting tension between what the two of you said with respect to, um, and this is a little bit of a kind of caricature, but between a kind of managerialism and a, and a, um, and a kind of a reflexive deliberation. And the problem of managerialism is a problem of standardization, a problem of commensurability, right? And the problem of, of kind of deliberative reflexivity is, is, as you put it, Greg, the word of complicated. Takes too many evenings. It takes too many evenings. <laughs> but but uh, so I wonder if you would comment on that, because surely it is a problem in the project of knowing biodiversity, how to study biodiversity, that one does it in a domain that was already configured in certain sorts of ways. There are ways of collecting the taxonomies of beetles. There are ways of, of established ways for constructing models for, for discerning values of ecosystem services such that you can describe them in terms of a set of, you know, trained values in the context of market dynamics or whatever. There's certain ways of making lists of endangered species act requires, et cetera. And that that surely matters for how one constrained in how we know the objects of biodiversity, and ditto for the way that stands in relation to a project of deliberation. It says, what are we valuing anyway? Well, if you got your regime, if you got your market built already, the value system is set. Please don't ask any questions. Right. Well, so in terms for the for the 
reflexive approach. I mean, you can't you can't begin a reflexive process from nowhere any more than you can take a view from nowhere, right? You have to begin sort of where you are in some sense. Um, I mean, you were, you were talking, th th this was kind of where, when we were talking about where the global observatory would be housed and run, I mean, this is kind of, it's, it's a version of that kind of problem, right? It's, um, um, I, I, you know, yeah, I, 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 um, I don't know. Um, you, you can't get totally outside the systems that you want to challenge, any more than you can get totally outside the, you know, a language to think about a new, a, a new and better value scheme. Um, and so uh, you have to uh, uh, engage in criticisms, you know, from 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 within as best you can and try to set up structures that will uh, uh, make possible what looks like a kind of honesty and transparency in the discussion. Jack, it's in your hand. So uh, I just kind of want to jump in and, and say something that's maybe crazy, but that would potentially plug a hole here. Oh, in thank you. Of, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm thinking about uh, what happens when scientists uh, define you know textbook meanings and standardize things and, and find out operational ways to measure them. Um, does that uh, weaken or thin out the uh, categories of experience that the public that everyone else has of biodiversity and nature? So, so getting back to this idea of where does our caring about nature ground out? Well, in the stories that we have about it and how we make those stories. That was a sort of literary sense of why we care. Um, and I think of something like iNaturalist uh, giving people a new way to make stories about nature because it's uh, an interesting interactive way of engaging and conceptualizing what you're looking at. Where it's like, it's this bush with this interesting berry, and I couldn't go any further than that on my own until I have this computer recognize the image for me and put and suggest a name, right? And then I can follow the name um, or, or watch how people come in and annotate my picture after the fact and feel connected to these scientists, these experts even if I've never met them. And so that, to me, seems like a way in which being precise about biodiversity richens the literary uh, connection that everyone has to the world, uh, rather than um, you know, thins it out or cheapens it. And so being precise in that way can be productive um, in building how we care about nature. Maybe that's a criterion we should be looking for, not who's in charge or whose concept wins the day, but do we get a, a richer aesthetics of nature for everyone to, to use to care about it um, as a result of coming up with these standards and these textbook definitions? I'm going to respond to that, but I actually am going to chime in on this set of questions first because as you were answering, I was realizing I am so out of my element here. I'm not a philosopher, and I'm so challenged by this discussion because I'm viewing um, this in so much more of a structural, operational perspective. And so I hear your probing about these definitions and who defines them, but it, and, and then in contrast or potentially can hear, hear Beckett's perspective in, in my simple perspective, I think here we have this thing called biodiversity, right? And then we have these arrows going into what, what it means. So one is who the stakeholder is, who the public, is it an indigenous community? Is it a you know, kid using an app? Um, th that, there's one lens that I think you had some great insight on. And then on this lens of, I can't remember the word you used, Ben, but it was operational or something like that, that managerial, is in a sense the the management, the, the legislation, the rules and regulations that are put out by um, our, our laws in the US and globally, the Convention on Biodiversity, the Endangered Species Act, or even within the corporate sector, the you know, corporate sustainability, no net loss. Th that, those are the structures that then provide the lens into like, what, what should we be caring about? And I, in my view, there is an undue, um, bias in that management world on species. And the reason is, is that we just, the complexity of function and ecosystems 
it is just something that we, ha we haven't really nailed down the science in a way that we can actually bring it to those domains so that we can move beyond the species definitions. So I think I, probably a completely different answer and um, perspective than uh, many of you are thinking, but I guess to me it seems, I'm, maybe I'm just super black and white, that you know we have this thing, there are these textbook definitions, how those manifest by stakeholders and decision makers depends on the lens. I'll just say I, I like your answer very much as a, a way of filling out what I was saying about the why. Uh, I think that's exactly right. Uh, when the scientists can illuminate a little bit more, you know, the role that something has in the system and, and gives you a, a story um, as a as a way of uh, making headway on the how the how the conversation question should be run. I'm not I, I'm not sure that uh, it's making any headway, but but yeah, I think we're a about out of time, so I saw Anna's hand and then maybe back here. Okay. I was going to ask if, as it is understood currently and popularly, are complexity and diversity the same thing? And if not, should they be? I, I kind of want to turn that question to Ben Blonder. He's in the room. Is he still? <laughs> oh no, did he just leave? Oh. Um, are complexity and diversity, no, they're not the same thing. In some cases, complex systems mean more diversity. In other cases, there isn't that relationship. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that I understand, okay, say I'm a policymaker, okay, sit in the city of Tempe or in DC, and you come to me, you got 10 minutes of my time, and, you, and I say, uh, why is this important to you? And you tell me if you do this or don't do this, there's going to be a thousand species that are going to be lost. Okay, I'm sitting there going, a thousand species? What does that mean? Explain that to me. I'm going to take the <laughs> No, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's okay. Well, I feel like <laughs> when you tell somebody, you know, 500 species, a thousand, 10,000, we're losing things at a rate of. Are percentages a year? What, seriously, what what does that mean? Uh, I'm not sure. I, uh, what, what, yeah, I'm not sure. I understand. What does it mean for what? What in terms of uh, 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 the amount of loss? Yeah, yeah, the amount. Yeah, the amount. Of, simple as that. The amount of loss. Yeah. Do you mean like why people should care, or no. the no. proportion? The, the, okay. the hit. The hit that made the natural world is taking. And if, say, say I like chocolate chip cookies, okay, and you see them sitting on my desk, and you'll say, well, this is the reason why you should care. If it's 10 chocolate chip cookies in three years, if you don't care, then you're only going to have five. That will grab my attention. So, I mean, how do you, uh, how do you put I it, think it is a question for you. you. How do you bring it down from the 60,000 foot level I, I to a, a, a conversation? So I don't have a good answer, but um, at one point I did this, uh, in some leadership training, um, mock congressional testimony, and it was about protection, protecting species. And part of the the case we were making was, um, you know, about strengthening the Endangered Species Act. And I remember um, doing this this testimony to congressional staffers where I talked about, you know, there's so much diversity on the planet we haven't even described much of it, and therefore we should be careful what we do so that we don't lose more and you know the response was well if we don't even know what it is why should we care i'm not i don't have an answer to that maybe you do no i'm i'm, I'm good at this point <laughs> i'm answering your question with a question yes and that's okay that's legitimate i think it would help if you tell them the estimates for the total number of species on the planet and what proportion are yeah. lost each year yeah that's the kind of number you're looking for few million to 100 million or more. Mm -hmm. We don't know. It depends on the taxonomic group. But, yes. All right. So Millions. Complex, and I think that sort of illustrates why we wanted to start with this question of, well, what are the concepts and, and how do we get at them? And so let's thank the panel for opening this discussion.